February 9th, 1980. An unremarkable Saturday in the lives of many, but for one man, it was a date that would change his life forever. In the 76th minute of the English First Division tie between Norwich City and Liverpool at Carroll Road, a young man would stamp his name into English football folklore with one of the most remarkable strikes ever seen on a football pitch. Ryan, Fashion Oh! oh! Justin Fashionu, Norwich's number nine, had thrust himself into the public consciousness with one swing of his left foot. One year later, he became the first black £1 million player in the history of the game. Surely this would be the springboard for a lengthy and successful career. However, his footballing ability would become secondary after the revelation that Justin was gay, making him not only the first openly gay footballer, but an openly gay black footballer during a time where discrimination was arguably at its zenith. This is the story of the enigma that was Justin Fashionu. Born on February 19th, 1961, Justin Asoni Fashionu was the son of a Nigerian barrister and a Guyanese nurse. Even from a young age, Justin, as well as his brother and future England international John, would not have it easy in life. After their parents split up, both Justin and John were sent to Bernardo's care home as their mother, Pearl, was unable to cope as she already had two other children whom she was trying to support on her own. The brothers were fostered by Alf and Betty Jackson, an elderly couple who had retired to the town of Shropham near Norwich. During this time, John would cling to Justin and the bond between the two brothers seemed to be unbreakable. The boys were frequently visited by their birth mother who, upon seeing how well the boys were being treated, felt it would be unfair to take them away from such an environment. And so, the brothers continued to live in Norfolk with their foster parents. As they grew, they became aware that they were the only black children in the entire village and had to get used to explaining to all the other children why they looked different from them. Despite this, Justin would claim in an interview in 1981 that both himself and his brother didn't really have any major problems growing up in this environment. We're 100 miles away from London, um, we're 20 miles away from Norwich and we're a little village and there aren't that many coloured people anywhere around. Or at that stage, there weren't any, any coloured people about. So we didn't have the problems that were going on in London at that time. Throughout his school days, Justin was regarded as bright, but not a hard worker. It was in athletics that he really excelled, particularly in running and boxing. However, it was football where Justin's real talent lay. At the age of 13, he was invited to a trial for Norwich City. Former Chief Scout Ronnie Brooks immediately saw the ability that Justin had and took it upon himself to take Justin under his wing and guide the young man on the right path. As Justin was progressing into the professional ranks, his brother John was finding it difficult to break through. I got turned down by four or five clubs who said at the time, look, you know, sorry, you're not, you're not good enough. And that was a direct result of having a brother with the name Fashion because they all expected me to be as good as him. Justin made his league debut for Norwich on January 13th, 1979, at the age of just 17 against West Bromwich Albion at Carrow Road. During his two seasons at Norwich, Justin scored 40 goals in 103 senior appearances, including that wonder strike against Liverpool, which won the match of the day goal of the season award in 1980. During this time, Justin was very outspoken about the fact that he was playing for black people and he wanted to inspire those who had suffered prejudices that they could indeed achieve great things. The thing that spurs me on is the fact that I am playing for black people who maybe have not had as good a life as I've had, who have been living in the ghettos and who have had the prejudices poured up against them all this time. I think that that's good for them to, show, to know that a black person can get on. I think it's a spur for them, so I think it gives them hope. In contrast to this, however, his brother John recounts that this is where their relationship began to change. John began to see an arrogance arise in Justin and felt like his success was beginning to go to his brother's head. So much so that John called Ronnie Brooks to talk to Justin to try and get him back on the right track. Justin seemed to embrace the attention for the most part, claiming that it made him feel wanted and appreciated and that it was something that he would miss once he stepped out of the limelight. However, the spotlight that Justin craved would eventually become too bright for the young forward would become something he desperately wanted to escape from. 
Justin's inevitable departure from Norwich City came in August 1981, as he was signed by two-time European champion Nottingham Forest for a fee of £1 million, making him the first black footballer in the history of the game to be bought for such a fee. Coincidentally, he was playing for the side who were the first to pay £1 million for a player, that being Trevor Francis in 1979. The man who signed Francis two years prior was the same who had brought in Justin, Brian Clough. Clough had a reputation in the game for being direct, brash and outspoken. Mix that with the confidence and bravado that Fashionu had, it was inevitable that there would be a clash between the two at some point. According to many, this is where Justin's downward spiral would begin as he, a 20 year old striker, was seen as nothing more than a commodity by his manager. A commodity whose only purpose was to score goals and do well for Nottingham Forest. With the relationship with his manager at an all time low, combined with the pressure to live up to his hefty price tag, Justin flopped at Forest, only scoring three goals in 32 appearances. Not only did Justin have to contend with the struggles in his professional life, but it was around this time that rumours started to circulate around his personal life. Due to his increasingly frequent visits to gay bars, many started to question Justin's sexuality. Amongst those was Brian Clough, who, upon discovering where Justin had been going, barred him from training with the side. In his autobiography, Clough recounts a verbal dressing down he gave Fashionu after hearing rumours that he was going to gay bars. Where do you go if you want a loaf of bread? I asked him. A baker's, I suppose. Where do you go if you want a leg of lamb? A butcher's. So why do you keep going to that bloody club? Clough would admit himself in his book that even his own wife reprimanded him for his prejudiced treatment of Justin. To be a gay man in the 1980s was to be confronted by overwhelming animosity. Despite homosexuality being decriminalised in 1967, widespread prejudice still remained. In the 80s, an already restrictive environment for gay men and women would become nothing short of hateful. The HIV virus became the ammunition to be used against gay and lesbian people due to the misinformation and downright lies that were spread throughout the media, such as suggesting there was something specific to gay people that rendered the community responsible for the virus. On February 7th, 1985, the Sun read a headline that read, AIDS is the wrath of God, says Vicar. In The People, the comedian Bernard Manning argued that gay actors should be banned from television, stage, clubs and pubs, so they do not, quote, corrupt the children. The Sun, billing another story under the tagline, another Red Hot Sun exclusive, ran another tale inspired by a man of the cloth. I'd shoot my own son if he had AIDS, says Vicar. It was amongst this backdrop that thousands were forced to suffer for being who they were. As for Justin, trying to keep his sexuality a secret amongst this turmoil, being a black footballer in the 1980s Britain, where racism was still prevalent, as well as desperately trying to turn around his declining form on the pitch, was a near impossible balancing act as he looked for guidance anywhere he could find it. During his time at Norwich, Justin had befriended local car dealer Terry Carpenter who, after seeing how upset and dejected Justin's demeanour was, invited him along to a church meeting in an attempt to lift his spirits. After continued visits to church, Justin became a born again Christian and vowed to dedicate the rest of his life and career to serving Jesus Christ. I've been playing football for Justin Fashionu. And I thought that from now on, I'm gonna play for him. I'm gonna to play to, to really please him. During his time at Forest, Justin was sent out on loan to Southampton, where he scored three goals in nine games. Saints manager Laurie McManamy was said to have been very keen on making Justin's loan move permanent, however was unable to do so due to lack of funds. Upon his return to Forest, yet another bus stop with Brian Clough saw Justin suspended from training. When Justin defied his manager and turned up at the training ground, Clough enlisted two police officers to remove Justin from the training pitch. I pulled two coppers onto a, a training pitch to remove Justin Fashionu. 18 months on from being the first £1 million black footballer, Justin Fashionu was sold to Forest's bitter rivals Notts County for a deal worth £150,000. He scored 20 times in 64 games for the Magpies over two seasons before moving on to Brighton in June of 1985, which is where Justin's fortunes would deteriorate even further. A crippling knee injury picked up whilst playing for Brighton would plague Justin for the remainder of his career. It's cost me everything really, so um, it's either going to be going back to playing soccer or being a road sweeper, one of the, <laughs> it's one of the two, but it's cost an awful lot of money. From there, Justin would bounce around from club to club, both in the United States and back home in England, 
as he tried to get his career back on track. However, in October of 1990, football would be the last thing on Justin's mind. Despite Justin's career being on the wane, his superstar lifestyle didn't change. According to his brother John, not having found success of his own, Justin would go to him for money but would continue to spend it on luxuries such as watches and cars. John claims that the reason why he had his affairs in order was because he saw how Justin had spent his wealth and he had used that as a template on how not to be wasteful and to take care of his money. It was this desperation for money that led Justin down a road that would ultimately define him as a man. Nine years on from rumours circulating about his private life, Justin found out that he was going to be exposed as gay by a newspaper. Panicking, he rang his agent, Eric Hall, who persuaded Justin to take the decision out of that particular newspaper's hands, and instead, give an exclusive to the Sun newspaper to say that he was indeed gay. The day before the story was due to break, he came out to his brother John, and told him that his story was to be released in the Sun the next morning. In response, John offered his brother the same amount of money that the Sun was going to pay Justin for the story, allegedly around £75,000, so as to prevent Justin from signing off on the story being released. However, it was too late. On the morning of October 22nd, 1990, the world would now know that Justin Fashionu was gay. A camera crew turned up to John's training ground and interviewed him about the story, where he spoke about his disbelief and his hurt that his brother had done this, before saying that he wouldn't want to be in a facility with a teammate if he knew he was gay. But I wouldn't like to to play or even get changed in the, in the vicinity of it. That's just the way I feel. So if I'm like that, I'm sure the rest of the football is like that. On an episode of the BBC's Open to Question in 1992, Justin was asked about that interview. His response was one of disappointment that his brother wasn't more tolerant of the situation, especially with everything they had been through together. In that same Open to Question interview, Justin claimed that he hadn't spoke to his mother since the story came out, as it was far too difficult for him to do so. In the following years after the story about Justin's sexuality broke, he would remain in the tabloids through fabricating stories of his private life in an attempt to make as much money as he could. This practice led to Justin being sacked by Scottish Club Hearts for making up a story about being involved in a sexual relationship with a Tory MP. Having ended his playing days in Britain in 1994, Justin returned to America where he turned to coaching as he looked to make the United States his permanent home. In February of 1998, Justin moved to Ellicott City in Maryland in order to help set up a new club, the Maryland Mania. On the night of March the 24th, an event here would change Justin's life forever. During a get-together at his home, a young man, identified solely as DJ, claims that he woke up to Justin performing a sexual act upon him, having spurned his advances earlier in the evening. Homosexual acts were still illegal in the state of Maryland at the time, and as this act was being performed upon the young man as he slept, he was not in a position to give any form of consent. Following the alleged assault, Justin was questioned by police and denied all accusations made against him. Following his questioning by the authorities, Justin left his home, telling no one where he was going. He did however contact a chaplain that he had met whilst in the US and told him his version of the events. According to what Justin had told this chaplain, named Lonnie Wortham, that despite himself and DJ being intimate together, he was innocent of all charges made against him. Furthermore, Justin claimed that DJ was blackmailing him into giving him a substantial amount of money. The young man however claims that he never intended to blackmail or even sue Justin, but he simply wanted justice to be served. Unbeknownst to his family, Justin returned to England and spent four days at the Mount St Bernard Abbey, a Catholic retreat in Leicestershire. Throughout his life, there had always been a conflict between his faith and his sexuality, and Justin was aware that he was a mixture of contradictions in that regard. He was struggling to come to some sort of understanding about who he was, and spoke to those in the monastery of his regrets about squandering the opportunities that had come his way in his life, and how he would do things differently if given the chance. On April 18th, Justin left the Abbey and was encouraged by Lonnie Wortham, the chaplain in the US, to return to Maryland to set the record straight and attempt to clear his name. However, Justin would never get that opportunity to plead his case. BBC Radio 4, it's six o'clock, the news with Corrie Caulfield. The former footballer Justin Fashionu has been found dead in a garage in East London. It's understood Fashionu, who was 37, died from strangulation. On the morning of May 3rd, 1998, 
at the age of just 37, Justin Fashionu was found hanged in a deserted lock-up garage in Shoreditch in London. He had found out the police in Maryland had issued a warrant for his arrest on charges of second-degree sexual assault, an offence which carried a 20-year jail term, first-degree assault and second-degree assault. Despite not having really spoken for nearly seven years, John was shocked and distressed upon finding out about his brother's death. Justin's mother was inconsolable, desperate to find out the reason why her son had seen this as his only way out. None of Justin's family knew about the allegations in America and were forced to find out via the press in the following days and weeks. Well, if anyone finds this note, hopefully I won't be around to see it. But let's begin at the beginning. What a start. Everything going so well. Then I felt I was abandoned. Left alone without anybody to turn to. Being gay and a personality is so hard. But everyone has it hard at the moment, so I can't complain about that. I want to say that I didn't sexually assault the young boy. He willingly had sex with me. And then the next day he asked me for money. When I said no, he said, you wait and see. If that is the case, I hear you say, why did I run? Well, justice isn't always fair. I felt that I wouldn't get a fair trial because of my homosexuality. Silly thing, really, but you know what happens when you panic. The blood is from my wrists. Cut because I want to die rather than put my friends and family through any more unhappiness. I wish that I was more of a good son, brother, uncle and friend. But I tried my best. This seems to be a really hard world. I hope that the Jesus I love welcomes me home. I will at last find peace. It's been over 20 years since Justin Fashionu took his own life, but his presence lives on stronger than ever in the gay community. Fashionu was listed at number 99 in the top 500 lesbian and gay heroes in the Pink Paper, a publication covering gay and lesbian issues. In March 2009, the football team, the Justin Fashionu All-Stars, was named at a very special event in Brighton, supported by the FA. The team, named in his honour, was created by the Justin Campaign, which is a campaign against homophobia in football, and promotes the inclusion of openly gay players in the game. In 2017, Netflix released the film Forbidden Games, the Justin Fashionu story, bringing his tale to a new generation. On what would have been his 59th birthday, he was inducted into the National Football Hall of Fame in 2020, as his niece Amal accepted the award in his honour. Justin Fashionu was a pioneer, the first black footballer to be bought for £1 million, the first professional footballer to come out publicly as gay. A flawed individual who made some questionable decisions in his life, Justin wasn't helped by the environment that he and many others were living in at the time. For his story to end the way it did doesn't seem fitting for the impact that he made. At least now, his legacy can inspire others to be who they are and take pride in the life that they lead and the way in which they lead it. <laughs>